the panel chair. The panel's work is being conducted under the auspices of the National Academy of Sciences in response to a request from the Great Basin Unified Air Pollution Control District and the LAA Department of Water and Power. The panel has been asked to evaluate the effectiveness of alternative dust control measures to their degree of reducing the particulate matter emissions from the oven plate bed and reducing the water and controlling those emissions. Today, the panel will hear presentations that are relevant to this task. I'd like to emphasize to everyone that this is an information gathering session and that the panel has not uh, completed its deliberations. Comments made by individuals, including members of the panel, should not be interpreted as positions of the panel or of the academy. Uh, once the panel's draft report is written, let's go through a rigorous peer review process before a draft is considered an academy's report. Therefore, observers who draw conclusions about the panel's work today based on discussion will be doing so prematurely. I want to note that this entire session is on the record and is being recorded. Each presenter will be asked to provide remarks and then panel members will have the opportunity for follow-up discussion. Because of time limitations, the panel uh, and presenters should not be expected to entertain questions from members of the public. At 3.45 this afternoon, there will be an opportunity for members of the public to make brief comments to the panel. Uh, to make a comment, please sign up by 3 o'clock at the registration table. We can get to that here. Uh, uh, and each uh, speaker will have a maximum time limit of three to five minutes, depending on how many speakers we have. Uh, written comments from those listening in remotely can be submitted to Rita Gaston via the Zoom chat function or by email. After the meeting, anyone who wishes to submit written comments or other materials that are relevant to our charge should contact Fred Walsall, another uh, responsible staff officer for this time. So before we begin the presentations, I'd like to ask the panel members, Mr. Scott Tyler, to introduce themselves and go around the room here. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Scott Tyler. I'm a faculty member at the University of Nevada, Reno, and I'm a hydrologist. I am uh, Greg Oken. I'm a faculty member at the uh, University of California, Los Angeles Department of Geography. I'm Maria Barini. I'm a research scientist at the faculty at UC Riverside. Ted Russell, a faculty member at the Georgia Institute of Technology. I'm Dave Allen. I'm on the faculty of the University of Texas. My expertise is in air quality. I'm Christine Bitswas, Washington <coughs> University in St. Louis. I expertise in aerosol and air quality. Valerie Eschner at the University of California, Davis, and I'm a professor of ecology. Scott Van Pelt with the USDA Agricultural Research Service. Um, Working primarily in aeolian science and also crop water. And uh, do we have a committee member, particularly Venki, on the phone? Yes. Yeah. Venki, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, Akula Venkatram from UC Riverside. Okay, thank you. So let's proceed immediately to the speaker. Uh, I think we've got a lot of people in the room, okay. uh, and uh, rather than go through the entire room, we did a bunch of questions this morning. Okay. Uh, why don't we uh, uh, stay on task and uh, begin with our first speaker. So our first speaker is Patricia Moyer of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, she'll describe the department's role in Owens uh, Lake Dry Lake Bed Management, and we have a time slot of approximately 25 minutes um, for the uh, 15 minutes, excuse me, for this presentation. So uh, please go ahead. Greetings, everyone. You can sit at the table if you like over here. Uh, I might prefer to stand over whatever it's fine. That will remind me to speak up, hopefully. Um, I'll be reading to you. I don't have a fancy presentation for you. So if I'm reading too fast or if you have any questions, um, please stop me. So greetings, members of the Owens Lake uh, Scientific Advisory Panel. Tribal members, I, I don't see any today. Um, but this is being recorded, correct? Yes. Agency representatives and members of the public, 
Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address the panel today. My name is Patricia Moyer. I work for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife as the Habitat Conservation Program Manager, um, or Supervisor rather, out of the Bishop Field Office. Um, I only recently came to the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, and as such, I'm still trying to understand um, the complexities of Owen Lake and my department's role and responsibilities. And my um, briefing today is very basic and brief, and hopefully you won't have any questions coming. <laughs> <laughs> so just a brief history about the department. Um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, also known as Fish and Wildlife, was formerly known to most of you as the California Department of Fish and Game, or Fish and Game. Most of you may think of Fish and Wildlife as issuing fishing licenses and hunting licenses and enforcing state regulations. In fact, Fish and Wildlife's beginning date back to the Game Act that was passed in 1851 to regulate game hunting in the newly formed state of California. And in 1871, the state appointed the first game warden. So it's kind of the beginnings of the agency go to um, you know, what the majority of people think of. Um, along these lines, Something I found out in preparing for this presentation is that National Geographic apparently had um, a show called Wild Justice in 2010 and 2011 following Fish and Game Wardens. I don't know if any of you saw that. I haven't. I didn't know about it, so I, I definitely did watch it. Um, however, besides upholding the law to protect the state's natural resources and issuing fishing and hunting licenses, it, and California Fish and Wildlife does many other things some of which I will talk about shortly as they pertain only to the management of the space. Today, Fish and Wildlife is a state agency under the California Natural Resources Agency, and as such manages and protects the state's fish, wildlife, plants, and native habitats, and is responsible for related recreational, commercial, scientific, and educational uses of the state's resources. Um, fish and wildlife basically have two roles um, in the management of the lake. One is as a responsible agency under CEQA and CISA. One is as a trustee agency, and that's primarily what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, much of the Owens Lake bed is subject to Fish and Wildlife uh, Code Section 1600, which regulates lakes and stream beds and their operation. As responsible agencies, Fish and Wildlife, and specifically my program, have authority to approve and issue permits for the operations to the Owens Dry Lake Bed, such as constructing and maintaining and or repairing infrastructure, such as facilities, roads, water lines, berms, um, and converting one habitat type to another. Under these 1600 permits, Fish and Wildlife may require avoidance, minimization, and or mitigation measures such as no net loss requirements for bird nesting habitat, annual, annual monitoring efforts, and annual reporting. Fish and Wildlife is California's trustee agency for Fish and Wildlife Resources and holds those resources and trust by statutes for all the people of the state. Fish and Wildlife in its trustee capacity has jurisdiction over the conservation, protection, and management of all fish and wildlife, native plants, and habitats necessary for biologically sustainable populations of those species. Specifically, our program also reviews and comments on CEQA documents. As a trustee agency, we issue incidental take permits that don't really apply to um, the owned lake at this time and the aforementioned 1600 lake and stream bed operation agreement as a responsible agency. We also manage native fish and the habitat they depend on. We're involved in ensuring that there is no net loss of the state's wetlands and are now becoming involved in groundwater challenges the state is facing as groundwater can often support critical surface habitats for special status species and non listed plant and animal species alike. Fish and Wildlife is also charged with protection of all migratory and nesting birds. 
Owens Lake is now the largest wildlife site in Inyo County, with more than 100,000 shorebirds visiting Owens Lake on their annual migration. Fish and Wildlife's role includes ensuring that all activities on the lake maintain habitat value, supporting the continued use of the area by shorebirds, waterfowl, and other nesting and migrating bird species. So any type of um, changes to how the lake is managed in terms of dust control could trigger additional permitting from fish and wildlife, um, avoidance minimization, mitigation measures, or could be in direct conflict with existing permits and, and existing measures. Um, specifically, um, changing the use of water um, for dust control or uh, changing one habitat value to another um, could, could trigger fish and wildlife involvement and jurisdiction. So in conclusion, um, Fish and Wildlife Commission is to manage California's diverse fish and wildlife and plant resources and the habitats on which they depend for their ecological values and for their use and enjoyment by the public. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the panel? Yes. As far as the shallow flooded areas, are we going to be pretty protective of those? Yes, absolutely. So I have a question recognizing that you're new to your position and you don't know the answer. Perhaps you could get back to it uh, in due course. So when you talk about no net loss for wildlife and wetlands, is that a um, an ongoing resetting of the baseline, or do you refer back to some baseline year and say? We don't want any net loss from conditions that existed in some prior year. Yes, exactly the latter. So ah, right. the, the baseline does not reset. Okay. That's my understanding. Okay. And, and do you know what the baseline uh, is for comparison? Um, we have documents that we can provide yeah, that'll help you with that. Yes. Great, thank you. Other questions? Great, thank you very much. Let's go on and uh, proceed to the next presentation, uh, which will come uh, from two speakers. I'm not sure who's going to go first. Um, uh, but our two speakers are Peter uh, Humphrey, if I got that right, mm -hmm. and uh, also Michael Prater, uh, representing the Eastern Theater of Audubon. And uh, we ask that both presenters take no more, no more than a total of 30 minutes for their combined presentation, and we'll have questions from the panel. Where would you like me to be? Wherever you want to be. Uh, not there, but. I can see it. It's sitting distracting, it seems like not too good. Yeah. If you're a school teacher, which I was for a long time, you said you need significant. I need to be led. Um, okay, well, it's good to see this. I'm on the uh, checklist um, that we use for our, our bird festival uh, in the Friends of the Union. Well, oh, my name is Mike Prater. I live in Lone Pine. I've uh, been a citizen activist for decades uh, at Owens Lake. I started just as a simple burger around uh, the part of Owens Lake that never went away. Um, there were um, artesians and seeps and, and other things that created postage stamp habitat areas that we, that we would bird in spring and fall especially. Um, and we saw migratory uh, birds stacking up pretty heavily. Um, in the hundreds at the most, um, and and knew that when water was going to be spread by the square mile, that uh, we should anticipate significant numbers of birds returning, hopefully. Um, and, that's, and that's exactly what occurred. I'd like to thank the committee for uh, inviting Audubon. Um, we feel we had an important role that, that Peter will, will talk about. Uh, in the process that led to um, 
uh, the three-legged stool that he'll explain later. But um, I wanted to briefly just touch on um, the significance of Owens Lake now that there's square miles of habitat out there. And we have a habitat suitability model, we have a baseline. Jeff will probably get into that. Um, in 2001, the uh, National Audubon Society de designated Owens Lake as a, one of their important bird areas. This is an international program that came to the United States after they already started in Europe and the Middle East. Um, it's a program that is it's advisory, mainly is to inform um, managers, land managers, and decision makers. Uh, but the nature of it is that it's looking at what are the critical bird areas on the planet right now. Um, and, and that's important to do in an age of churning climates and, and change that we're not sure in which direction we're going sometimes. We just need to make sure that we're ready. So protecting refugia is one of the um, uh, adaptive management things you can do in dealing with climate. Owens Lake would certainly be a refuge. The Owens River um, with its red pairing and also. Um, last year, 2018, um, Owens Lake was uh, accepted as a part of the Western Hemisphere Showbird Reserve Network, uh, WISREN, if you like, uh, acronyms, uh, W-H-S-R-N, uh, WISREN.org out of the Manomet Science Center in Massachusetts. That's where it's coordinated. It is hemisphere-wide. It has very, um, very um, clear criteria uh, to be accepted into this, this network. Um, Owens Lake was accepted as a, uh, as a part of Lutheran with inter uh, at international importance. Not quite hemispheric, but international. It had to do with the numbers of American avocets, leaf sandpipers, and a large uh, nesting site for snowy plovers, the interior population. Um, there are currently about 104 sites in the entire Western Hemisphere, from Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego to the far north along the Arctic uh, Ocean. Um, we were the 50th site in the United States. Other sites are places like San Francisco Bay, Mono Lake, Humboldt, Sacramento Valley wetlands, and, and some of those kind of places. Um, so I guess in closing, my, my message is, is that Owens Lake is definitely on the map. It was a, a heritage wildlife location that was lost uh, in the 1920s and it has returned. Wasn't necessarily planned that way, but it has returned. Um, and that's all about uh, I have. My sister Kimberly Prather at UC, at UC San Diego is just that's, that's, my, right? that's my baby sister. <laughs> I'm very proud of her. I'm very proud of her. I just had to put that in there. You're talking about that. Anyhow, but that's, that's um, all I have. And, uh, uh, I'm very impressed with the list of people that are here looking at it, um, looking at our lake. Uh, I know it came through a settlement process, but it was a great idea, and you are great people uh, for that. Could be a little heavier on the biological side um, with the three-legged stool that uh, Peter can talk more about. Thanks. Any any other questions? Any 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 questions until the end? Oh, well, after Peter. Sure. Good afternoon. I'm neither a teacher nor a professor nor a scientist uh, nor a lot of other things. But I'm very happy to be with you this afternoon. My name is Pete Pumphrey. I'm uh, past president of the uh, Eastern Sierra Audubon Society, um, currently the conservation chair. Um, I just wanted to have a few minutes to talk to you about some context in which what you're doing and what's going on here in terms of the future of the lake uh, should be viewed. 
recognizing that Owen Blake has developed a hint of the avian habitat described by Mr. Prather here, Eastern Sierra Audubon and California Audubon joined together and convened a process which grew into what is now called the Owens Blake Master Plan, Master Project Process. You may have heard references to that, but it's really designed to take a look at what the future of the lake is in terms of operation, in terms of habitat, in terms of other things. The effort worked through more than 50 facilitated stakeholder meetings, workshops, and work groups. Among the outcomes was a unanimous agreement among all the parties, including Great Basin Unified Air Pollution Control Board and Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, that maintenance and enhancement of natural habitat was one of three primary objectives to guide the future of Owens Lake. Those three primary objectives focused on dust control, the idea of lessening the water commitment on the lake used for dust control, and habitat maintenance. No single goal was to be attained at the expense of either of the other two. Dust control and a reduction in the amount of water used in the process were to be achieved with no net loss of habitat function. This three-legged stool recognizes the significance of public trust values at the lake and the need to preserve those values as a path towards water efficient dust control is navigated. What do we mean here when we're talking about habitat? Owens Lake habitat is not monocultural. The lake supports more than 100 species of birds, plus mammals, amphibians, reptiles, and numerous plant species. In addressing Owens Lake habitat planning, avian species were focused on, partly because we're on a but also because they seem to be a good indicator of the health of the overall habitat at the lake. We went through many, many, I can't tell you, I, I tried to count them up in my head, driving down here this morning, the number of times I've been in this room in the last 10 or 11 years. Uh, I can tell you that it is way more than the number of times I ever thought I would be in this room when I didn't know it existed when we started, and way more than I contemplated as we went through the process. Part of the reason there were so many trips to this facility is that this group of stakeholders worked really, really hard. And they worked really, really hard over a period of six or seven years to really try to formulate a comprehensive understanding of the lake and in terms of the habitat work group with which I worked most closely, a comprehensive understanding of what the habitat here was about. So we took a look at those birds and we grouped them into gills. And the gills are species who are reliant basically on similar habitat characteristics. There are five of those gills, snowy plover and breeding shorebirds, breeding waterfowl, migratory waterfowl, migrating shorebirds, and species that are reliant on alkaline metal. We then identified the habitat components whose presence or absence characterized suitable habitat for each of these gills. The characteristics were weighted to create a quantifiable tool for evaluating habitat in specific locations for each gill. This was called the habitat suitability index. The index can be applied spatially over specific locations in the lake to generate a calculation of lake-wide habitat value for each of the individual gills and the lake as a whole. These were characterized, or this quantification was characterized as value acres. And I'm glad that Jeff Norton is here um, because I'm going to, as they say in committee hearings in Washington, yield my time to answer questions about how this model was put together and how it works for him um, because uh, he is better prepared and better equipped to answer them. The model has been peer reviewed on two occasions 
and provide the tool to establish one, a baseline of habitat value, to track changes and trends in habitat value for each skill, to undertake adapted management for existing dust control activities, and provide guidance in the design and implementation of future projects. Uh, and it is actually functioned in each of those capacities uh, during uh, the last uh, four or five years. It is that we have used it to see where we were, to try to figure out what the trends are, try and get an understanding of how those trends are uh, affected by factors that are perhaps outside the boundaries of the lake, and also to help in design with a project proposed and implemented by DWP uh, on specific locations of the lake. The model has been used in the development, successfully used, I believe, in the, success, in the development of these individual spatially specific projects. I've already told you I'm not a science person by training. I am more of a policy person. And so questions about the habitat suitability model are probably better directed to Mr. Norton. Um, and I don't know if I can make him. I can't make him do anything, actually. I've learned that. I don't know if I can ask him to come up and respond to questions before he gives his talk. But um, both Mike and I thought it would be best to be brief um, so that when you had questions about the uh, model and how it worked and how it measured habitat, you could ask them again. The point here is that a significant volume of work has been undertaken to fulfill the unanimous stakeholder commitment and directive to maintain vital habitat at Owens Lake. The lesson learned is that achieving that objective can take place in a way which is compatible with the goals of dust control and water efficiency. I would respectfully urge that as you move forward with your work here in this room, that you bear in mind that Owens Lake is more than dust control and water use. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions from the panel? Yeah. Questions. This may bridge both the biology, but uh, because you brought up policy angle, uh, you mentioned uh, factors outside the boundary of the lake being important. We have a good sense of what the policies are on the lake, but in terms of the factors that are important to the habitat value outside the lake, what are they and what's being done to control those factors? Well, I'd say the principal one is probably climate effects. Um, and um, by our work group, not much. We're not doing much to control that. Um, we're doing whatever we're capable of. I think that the, the question is, and the, and the reason it becomes important is because you have a desire to hold people to no net loss of habitat value, you also have to factor a way that allows them to function and deal and go forward if there are circumstances beyond their control that affect what goes on at this particular location. And so we spent a great deal of time trying to figure out how do you do that? How do you say you are accountable for this, but only to the extent that you're responsible for being able to maintain it? Um, and so I think that's really the principal one. Um, there could be, uh, who knows how many other kinds of policy disruptions. Um, we're never certain. Uh, what direction policy goes in over the long haul. So one of the things that we've tried to do is to institutionalize our work as much as we possibly can. The idea of an own Lake master plan master project is a step toward that institutionalization as it proceeds through the CEQA process, and hopefully adoption um, by the city of Los Angeles. Um, but I think that the, the most important thing that we have been able to achieve is create a culture now of cooperation and collaboration uh, where people have begun to recognize that they're not necessarily adversaries just because they have on different hats. Uh, that has been a bumpy road. 
Um, it has been a less bumpy road recently, but I don't. I certainly won't sit here and tell you that it's not going to be a bumpy road again in the future. Um, as factors like climate change maybe tighten the news a little bit around what we're trying to do here. But that, that's the pri primary one that comes to mind that I think I always at least try to bear in mind um, is, is going to make it mean that what we thought we were absolutely correct about when we sat here is going to turn out to, to be not absolutely correct at all. Other questions from the panel? Mm -hmm. Uh, just kind of continue with that. Um, we know that that um, uh, with existing shorebird species in North America and South America, um, because they belong to all of us, they belong to no one. Um, that even the ones that have tremendously high populations in the millions are in decline in general. Um, the impacts of climate change on our north. The permafrost, the nesting, um, the, the, the timing of flowering and bugs and, and all that kind of stuff, uh, possibly being scrambled or altered. Um, those are real concerns. But uh, but Peter's right. We, we were not looking building something that had to meet certain numbers of birds out there because there's just so much. I mean, Wilson Fowler oaks that are in Mono Lake right now, they're heading. They're going to head for Argentina. They'll, they'll take off from there and fly nonstop to the Altiplano of Bolivia. Uh, and then fatten up and then drop down into uh, uh, Marchiquita and, and other places in Argentina. So there's in route wetlands and, in, and questionable future, um, and there's also the nesting areas. So we're just trying to build a, the baseball field in Quarch, you know, Quarch build it and they'll come. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, and then, and, and, and so I'm going to be able to answer this too, but since you guys are the first guys, um, I mean, this is a, obviously it's a lake, so you're focusing on fly birds, but I'm, I'm sort of curious about the bird to use non aquatic um, resources that are around or on the lake in terms of salt grass. Yeah, that are. Savannah sparrows nest in tall grass, particularly. Um, it's also used for uh, uh, there's some uh, predators that hunt that, the, the northern harriers and, and, other, and others, um, uh, American kestrel and whatnot. Uh, it's also a winter area for some of those pasture uh, American pipits uh, come down in thousands all over the lake. Uh, horn larks that probably nest up on the alluvial fans in the desert scrub will come down onto the lake. Um, uh, so it's, as a wintering area too, there's just this tremendous abundance of alkali flies and there can be hatches at, even, at any month of the year, uh, even in winter. Um, and so it's tremendous. It's, it's a rare inland lake that has some winter populations of, of shorebirds, which is really unusual. Not large numbers, but I mean, uh, I would like to add on to Trisha's. Um, uh, we do have hundreds of thousands of birds um, through a season that will move through. Um, I think our highest number uh, on a single day was 115,000 birds. Um, 62,000 of them were shorebirds of 15 to 20 different species. Um, so the difficult thing is to be able to tell how long those birds stay here when they're passing through. Um, there's been some work on Western sandpipers that show four to six days. But a sandpiper is not a, a fellow who's going to fly to Bolivia. I mean, they literally double their body weight in two weeks. I mean, they would be so fat um, at Mono Lake and, and some down here that they, can't, they can barely walk. I mean, you can catch them in fishing nets. Uh, and then they just take off and they fly nonstop all the way. Did that help? I, I started with your question, actually. Uh, did I, I'm, I'm not to that at all. Or I just, no. I, I talked about habitat value. I just wanted to make sure that I understood the 
potential habitat value uh, area that weren't flooded. Right. Um, we've had migrations of the, the little lizard, the Uda, the size clutch lizard, um, all the way out onto the middle of the lake following the riprap. You know, just a beautiful rocky uh, pathway out there. Uh, we've had coyotes out there. Uh, Years ago, somebody had a toothless mountain lion out there. We've had bighorn sheep in a saltgrass meadow long ago. I think a bear. Um, spiders, lizards, um, and uh, horn larks and pipits. Those are big number of birds. And, and they use the areas that, uh, they can use the areas that have no water. The small mountains. Yes, uh, gophers, of course. There's nowhere a gopher can't go. I've seen them at 12,500 feet on the ridges in Sierra. Um, raccoons, uh, like I said, coyotes. Uh, coyotes are one of the possible predators in snow. Well, I think Jeff can speak to this at yeah. some point. Yeah. But, yeah. but it is, you make a good point in your question. That the shallow flood areas are not, are by no means, the only areas on the lake that support um, uh, natural life. Uh, and as the lake unfolds, um, the managed vegetation areas, for example, as they come into uh, uh, more stable states, begin then to attract um, their own suite of birds and, and um, and other animals. Uh, part of the reason that we chose to talk about habitat at Owens Lake on a lake-wide basis was the fact that you can't pin down spots and say into perpetuity, this is where these birds need to be. It was an attempt made to do that uh, a while ago. Um, and uh, an area was designated as the flower area, uh, and then as the lake evolved and the projects evolved on the lake, the, the plumbers apparently lost track of the boundary line uh, of their area, and they all moved. And so that area was no longer rich in, in, in supporting habitat for those particular birds. But it's a very, you, you wouldn't think it necessarily conceptually when you think about Owens Lake, and it's kind of a, I think of it as an industrial lake. But it's very dynamic. And, and the habitat in the, in the years that I've been involved in this process has changed significantly. And as that happens in turn, the species go with it. And so it, it, we had to look at the lake as a whole, and it took us quite a while to actually realize that and come to grips with that, simply because the birds vote on their own. And they really, I found this uh, to be true uh, here certainly, but in a lot of other, they just really don't care what my opinion is about where they ought to be on this lake. Uh, and they're not bound by it, and they're not bound by some kind of line. So we really have to talk about and look at the lake as a whole, where it was going, and make sure that it wasn't so important where a particular habitat resource was. It was important that it was there. It was on the lake at such and such a quantity if such and such a condition of health, but it could move because they'll move with it. Yeah, it's just, I mean, obviously, where there's not water, the wildlife falls off. If it's over the cliff, you're not, you're not seeing, you're not going to see much. Um, uh, Jeff, stop me if I'm, if I'm stepping on your toes here. I have no problem with that. But what, the grand compromise, the grand bargain. Uh, with Audubon and Water and Power, because this was a dust project, not a wildlife project, for a, for a while. Now it's both. The bargain was, at least the way I read it, because I was there, was that Audubon realized a tremendous hit on the water resources in the city of Los Angeles. You know, four million people, half the aqueduct possibly flowing out here. Um, so Audubon approached DWP staff, decision makers, senior managers, whatever, that we were willing to help <coughs> save significant water if they would commit to significantly protecting and enhancing habitat over time for 
migrating trophies and others. So there are places out there where there's a lot of water, and consistently we wouldn't see any wildlife use. Now, I don't know if we ever figured out why. Uh, there might even be brine flies there. So, uh, but that, that's what got to happen. Kept us in the room. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. Just, just a, a quick one. We may not be addressed to, to you gentlemen or, or even Jeff, but we've heard a few times about this master plan, master project. And do we have that? Is there documentation of where that stands so the committee could have resources access to? And also the tool. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm, 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 we have we did a presentation on the first one. It was presented, yeah. yeah. What specifically are you looking for? Uh, I, well, is there kind of a, a single document or a set of documents that is in the master project direction? Or is it maybe an executive overview? There's a draft. Uh, 2010, wasn't there a draft that came out? Or 2016? The EIR is being developed. Um, there's been uh, a lot of work done by um, various working groups, groundwater working groups, habitat working groups, and they've developed recommendations and resource protection protocols that speak to everything that uh, Mike and Pete have discussed here. Um, and there also have been several projects that have already been built under that framework since 2013. So as far as the future, those documents are still being developed. There, well, it, it's on the website, you know, lawp.com, and you go to Long Lake Birds and you can't, you're trying to cheat them to the website. Uh, there used to be a big download, like 50 megabyte download for like the draft. And I know things have changed in the website. I can have a pamphlet? You no. Know, I mean, there was a hard copy that everybody was getting at one time. It's been a while. But there's a download. Uh, is that Jeff or? You know, the flu presentation out there. No, I, I don't know. You might be talking about something else. This concept's been around for like yeah. a decade. So it might be a document. The first concept is like it's outdated, 2014, but it was kind of more of a concept document. Yeah. As far as what is available, I'm referring to in our the advisory committee's recommendations to be so a big compilation of all the habitat work, all the different work groups. Um, and what they recommend to the UDP. So I'm being presented on how we're putting all these pieces together. We're not done yet, but how it's, how we're kind of trying to think to incorporate this into this master plan. Can I just actually follow on that? I mean, could, I guess I feel like there's a mixed message of the master plan last time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I mean, it's a question for anybody who wants to answer. When the thing is finalized, what power will it have besides the power to say, hey, we don't talk about this? We said it should be this. So, in other words, is it, is it a document and a plan that will have any value in terms of actually making legally required decisions, or is it more of a Process to help people talk through things and all the kind of agreements and stuff, but you know. Like so, any project we put out there has to go through CEQA, and uh, all of the necessary permits have to be obtained. And all of the permits and the CEQA documentation and analysis, those are all legally binding types of documents. That's what we're, I think that answers your question of if, if we're going to present a plan and a project, that's what we. Uh, so the master plan will go through CEQA. Yes. And as a result, it's become part. Exactly. So you know, there was no legal decisions here, no settlement kind of thing, but there was there was a need for a lease from the State Lands Commission that owns the lake. And so Audubon worked with State Land staff to try to get a lot of the bird type material and whatnot into that lease, as well as fish and wildlife. Much of the much of the mechanisms uh, went into that 1600 permit, that lake that alteration permit. So that, that's kind of how it's codified. And then see what I'm like. No questions from the panel? Okay. Thank you. Now, I have one. You, you mentioned, and you've been hinting at this, but I'd like to sort of give you a follow up answer. You, you mentioned the two of the, the old or migratory. Can you talk in general terms about? 
the, the migration pathway for someone who doesn't know much about uh, uh, about the migratory birds. I, I think you're going to be talking. You're going to talk more broadly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Some of them, it's it's enormous distances and hemis changing hemispheres and jump a bit into that. Okay. It's, there's some great books out there trying to use titles for lay people. Other questions? All right, well, then thank you very much. And uh, let's move on to uh, Jeff. So, uh, uh, Jeff Norton from LA Department of Water and Power will provide a quick presentation on the ecology of Owen's Lake. Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Pete and Mike and Tricia. I'm going to uh, I'm going to dive into really the ecology of some of the data alluded to, some of the, the, the data you collected, um, and then kind of wrap up on where uh, where it is for the policy, what we've, what we've implemented to date. Um, so uh, I am uh, I'm a watershed research supervisor. I'm part of our land and watershed management group that helps manage not only Owens Lake, but LA owns about 300,000 acres throughout the valley. And of the various bio and spring conservation and so forth to help manage that that line along with Owens Lake. I've been working on Owens Lake for about 10 years. Um, I oversee the biological and uh, environmental work. Uh, my background is quantitative ecology, community ecology. So, um, so some of you are, are, are from uh, not from the area. I wanted to give you a picture of Owens Lake and kind of talk about the geography. So we're looking at uh, to, the, to the west of Sierra Nevada, there's North Era, kind of Orient View. That's the most striking feature of the, of the Sierra Nevada. Um, it's uh, some of the highest peaks in, in California. Most of the 14,000 peaks are right here in the Sierra Nevada. Um, so that uh, is responsible for, at least in part, the very low rainfall that we get, big rain shadow. About six inches of a bishop, you know, three or even less spring on the lake here. Um, but it's also um, uh, the other kind of extreme is you see the lowest part of California in that valley is also right in Neo County. So there's a, there's a huge change in topography in this area. Um, it's also at an intersection between the Great Basin Desert to the north. It's really the first uh, basin and the Great Basin Range and the Mojave Desert down. Uh, to the south, which is a, a, a warmer desert, doesn't have frost uh, very often, whereas Great Basin is, is very cold. And Owens Lake, you got to experience some of the heat, although today was actually a pretty nice morning. You know, it's really hot, dry conditions in the summer, you got to see that, but it's also cold and blistering and windy in the wintertime. So very full of ex extremes here. Um, uh, a couple other landforms, uh, I'll put them up for you. So Sierra Nevada Range, Bordered by the Inu Mountains, another very fairly tall mountain range, 11,000 feet or so, goes up to the white, which is another uh, 14,000 foot from the Inu White outside of Bishop. Um, so, very deep valley. To the south, there is Coastal Range, Coastal Range, and then other landforms you see. This is, uh, oh, there we go. So, this is a picture of about 2000, naturally sort of modern Owen Lake. We generally refer to it as the Brine Pool. Um, and other features, this is a uh, CDP constructed reservoir, North Indy Reservoir, with an aqueduct. Um, it's one of the, the, the last impoundments before it goes into a pipe um, to go down south, and then the Owens River comes in. So, uh, in case you haven't figured out where you are sitting right here on the edge of the Owens River. Um, so, it's hard, you guys are out there, so you saw the scale, it's so hard to convey. The scale of Owens Lake. This is my slide. This is a picture kind of right by the Brine Pool. It's just a, open 110 square miles. It's just hard. You can't appreciate it until you're, you're standing here. So this is kind of my effort to, to talk about talk about scale. Um, so I'm going to spend a little time talking about the curve of Owens Lake is dynamic. It very much is not only across the lake, but through time. So I hit a couple of those points here. So Owens Lake, when you go back 120,000 years, 180,000 years, it was once the first, depending on if you count Moto Lake and Crowley, uh, is the 
first of a series of inland, uh, inland lakes across the Mojave Desert. So water from Owen, it wasn't a, wasn't a basin there. It wasn't a uh, blue basin back that far. Water would flow down to China Lake, Cereal, Cereal Panamint, and then eventually over to uh, Pleistocene Lake Manning. Huge inland uh, set of lakes when the, the environment was much more easy. We commissioned, as part of uh, some of the interpretive panels, we did the Phase 7 and we commissioned uh, Laura Cunningham, who does Pleistocene paintings. Um, uh, and so this is really trying to catch a, a lake level during the Pleistocene, sort of what it looked like, oh, just to give people what if you were standing here in a place, what it looked like. And we just tried to be accurate. This is a haystack we'll point it out tomorrow, um, uh, where it's surrounded by water. So granite, I was talking kind of in the email. Um, oh, I also want to mention, so this is a really wet time period, but Owens Lake, I don't have photos, uh, so you go back that far, but Owens Lake was also, had very south of dry, a of, of very drought, uh, long, long standing drought such that the shoreline disappeared at least six, six instances, sometimes for thousands of years, one known to be 12,000 years ago, five to 6,000 years ago, where Owen Lake was essentially modern, dry, dry, dry completely. So, another kind of crazy, crazy dynamic to this, to this uh, last 10,000 years. Uh, a couple of notes on Owen Lake and uh, his, his host basin. Right, they're more variable than freshwater, uh, just uh, not only salinity, but lake elevation up and down, up and down. Um, salinity is, is very high in the areas that are, that are um, you know, mostly salt. Uh, but they also vary. When you're talking really salinity lakes, they vary annually and seasonally, depending on, on runoff. Uh, different chemicals and ephemeral and episodic, you can have big, even when it was like it was dry, big flood events, it would flood part, parts of the lake. So they would sort of in, have a bunch of habitat value, have a bunch of birds, but that's that is very short lived. Um, and then, really important part here is why Owens Lake is, is so important ecologically is when you have this moderate, moderate high salinity, you don't have too many of these forage invertebrates, but you have incredibly high abundances of things like brine fly and brine shrimp, and that's what the birds. Why do you have hundreds of thousands of birds here? They're coming to feed off of these very super abundant um, food source during their migration. So um, here's some photos. This is this is Owens Lake. If you think back, you know, before dust control, we had uh, along the edge. I'll put up a photo of Owens Lake. This is about 2,000 uh, alkaline meadow on the left there. Uh, the so on the left, and then during low time periods of low evapotranspiration, water would spill out from the fly, and that would still that would provide how does that value even though the lake was gone. Um, the the birds would key in on this, but as soon as high evaporation time periods came, that would usually dry back. <laughs> so this is a snow clover. That's what they relied on. They kind of were out in the middle of nowhere where not much else was. They, they nest out there and they forage on these little, little puddles. Um, this photo here on the, on the lower right is kind of showing where you've got uplands and then water seeping out onto the lake to these little seeps that, that occur on kind of the lake fringing area. Um, so here's Owens Lake on the, on the right there. Just to kind of go through the dynamic portion of Owens Lake during this time period, uh, before settlement on Owens Lake, we start about 110 square miles, um, and so European settlement is what I'm, I'm referring to. After European settlement, um, many, many uh, miles of canals were built, and there were eight uh, big diversions off of Owens, off of Owens River up north uh, that could divert over 1,200 CFS. And so between the time of settlement, 1874 or so, so the time LA bought the land, Owens Lake actually decreased by about 30 feet. So um, here's a picture of the wetlands that developed as the lake receded that those seeps formed this uh, alkaline meadow, we call it transmontane alkaline meadow. And this, uh, this uh, polygon you see on the edge of Owens Lake, they are, uh, they were uh, delineated about the time of 2000, about 
time of the image that is taken. Note up here, that's not groundwater, that's not seepage from the lake shore. Up here in the north, that's from the old Rose River project that was water uh, around 2006, but there's still well on the that. Okay, and then uh, just to complete the picture here, 1913, the LA aqueduct was completed, and that took most of the surface water to, to LA. So, Owens Lake 2017. 2017, we see Charles Flood there, but you also see Owens Lake really filling with water because we had such a high, high runoff of that. Um, so big difference, all of the shallow flood. Now we have a uh, uh, very cha big change in ecology. So I put here a picture of brine trim. Last record I can find before dusting coal was uh, early 1900s, brine trim abundant in the lake shore. No records that I ever saw, I've ever seen brine trim until <laughs> the shallow flood. So now they're super abundant in our pond and one of the main food sources for uh, the birds that come to feed for in the collagic uh, uh, environment. So with that, Owens Lake became an important migratory stopover for shorebirds and waterfowl, again, sort of, uh, along the Pacific Flyway. So the Pacific Flyway is uh, going to the, the migratory patterns because shorebirds and waterfowl are very they have to find water to, to feed on their way. Their paths are very set. So they, they hit these, particularly these inland, the inland species, hit in the inland lake, uh, going up Owens Lake, uh, Lake Haber is one. They often in the springtime they skip one lake because it's very high elevation. So primary productivity hasn't picked up in this time they, they start. So one that's very important in the fall, not so much in spring. But Owens Lake, lower elevation. It's a really important stop over the shorebirds and waterfowl as they migrate more. Um, another thing is that shorebirds are smaller bodies, so they need to stop more often to, to build up their fat reserves. Whereas these larger birds, waterfowl, deer breeds, they can take one, one stop from their wintering area to their breeding area, and they don't, they don't need to stop to fill up. Um, and Mike mentioned some of these birds, they go, they, they start down in the uh, in South America and go up to the Arctic to degree. A lot of the other shorebirds breed in a pretty popular region, Canada and Montana. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the bird uh, numbers that we see. So um, these are just, I put up a couple graphs so we can all move them at the same time. Uh, notice the scale was that we already talked about our gills. These are, these are groups of birds that use resources in similar way. Waterfowl, we'll talk about what they need later. Shorebirds, usually small, shorter, smaller leg, and diving waterbirds. The scale, so this is, I just put up the month, the survey month that we do a, yeah, there we go. So these are just the survey months um, uh, of when we do surveys. And then we've got number of birds on the Y. Notice we're in the, and about the access changes here in the 10,000 birds. So waterfowl we'll start with. Um, waterfowl generally don't don't use the, the inland Owens Lake route to go north to breed. Um, and then in fall when they start coming back, September that's where they use this as a fall staging area. So waterfowl by far the most abundant in fall. And this is driven by one species in particular, northern shovel. So we move the shorebirds, very different pattern um, that during their migration, April is the peak, and uh, this, the points are just meant to kind of give you a, a relative context. If you were to really survey every week, the birds are only here for a very short time. We don't know exactly how long, but it's probably measured in days. So if you miss that peak count in April, you can miss 30,000 birds on your peak count. And then they are, and by May, Oddly enough, summertime is the time where you have the least amount of birds on Owens Lake. The, the, it's a hot, dry condition, so you only have a few green birds. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about some of birds. And then coming back, I mentioned uh, in, in July, we don't do a count, but we just start getting our first shorebirds start to come through. And then August, September, the, the, the um, migration is more protracted coming back in the fall. So common species, uh, we saw American Avocet. I just, all of this is driven by a few of your really common species that depend on 
these inland nesting, or these, these inland sites. California Gold being one, they don't never really breed here, but they use this Lamona Lake is a little too cold to go to. They come here, get ready to stage, and then they're right now, most of them are up in Mona Lake breeding. Uh, so there's a gray bar, and then it, it falls off in May, and then we don't have very, we have very few in the fall. Collegiate sandpipers, they're the, the bulk of the birds we see in April. By far, the bulk of the birds that come through are these collegiate sandpipers. American abacets are another shorebird that we that, that breed here, but also some more come through. They're the red that come through that um, in spring and then come back in the fall. Ear greaves, ear uh, greaves are really known for Mono Lake. You can have millions at, at, at Mono Lake. They see the skip owens because they've got bigger, they're bigger birds. They can they can fatten up and make their wintering flight all in one stop. But we still see a few, and it does provide habitat. But you're talking bigger open ponds. That's the, the blue. Uh, red duck. Um, that's a, a, a waterfowl. That a significant portion of the population comes here. They also like bigger ponds. And then shrub shoveler. Uh, over over 50 percent can be our uh, our waterfowl, our northern shoveler, and they're the, they're the green fall is their time period. They do not come um, through in spring very much. And then we move over to, to snowy plover. Notice the scale has changed here. We're talking hundreds of birds as opposed to tens of thousands of birds. Um, this is kind of a 500 on the dot was an early survey that was done in 78. This was a really wet year. We had plovers that were in odd spots. But the generally before dust control, we were in hundreds of birds. With dust control, that increased the population into, into five or 600 birds. And then coming, this, this down, downturn was, was probably mostly related to the drought. And we, we had, didn't work, didn't serve it this year, but we're looking at a totally upward trend here as they respond to the drought. Uh, if you're interested in foliage, one, one note, because it is such a marquee bird, we looked at wintering range in, um, in Los Angeles County, and you could significantly predict the count on Owens Lake by just looking at how many wintering birds on LA County. We don't ban birds, we don't really know where they winter, but that's interesting. That, that there's a lot of correlation. This is an inland nesting population. They are a separate, distinct population from the uh, endangered species here in Palm Coast. Are they, sorry to yeah. interrupt, but are they considered threatened or endangered? They have, uh, they are a species of special concern. They don't have yeah, in California. In California. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the Owens, the Owens Lake dust control areas. Um, we kind of, we've already visited to see how variable they are. One thing that we mapped that we, we used uh, uh, remote sensing and LIDAR information is to get how deep the ponds are. Very important uh, aspects of, of habitat. So darker areas are deeper, lighter areas are, are shallower. This is a, a, an older analysis um, around 2012. The other thing that's really important is salinity. So up here I have salinity. Um, so green is really fresh. Again, this is an older map for those of you because it's dynamic, it's changed since then. And the red is hypersaline really salty areas. But with, uh, to target the best productivity for inverts is more in the yellow. Um, the yellow and green, the thing that I have really was productivity standards. So these are important things that I'll talk about when we talk about how to model. So a couple of things of note I want to highlight. I think we've hit all these points, but we heard this before. The project was designed and built for dust control. Another thing is it was built really quickly for to meet regulatory deadlines. Um, the, the stages were built without kind of thinking about how integrated they were. Very important point. Habitat creation, while uh, evident, was entirely incidental, right? What happened, there's some good areas that were good habitat that inadvertently was created, and there's some areas with a lot of water and, and no birds that we, we change. Uh, we'll talk a lot about management and its uh, dynamics. So because of this, there is a pretty novel ecosystem with areas that uh, a lot of the poor habitats have been already converted and we've left the good areas. But there was areas that we put a lot of water out Generally, it's to be salinity related. We didn't get bird views. So, all this is really important information when we thought about how we got modeled. We got cool um, inadvertent experiments that, that helped us understand bird views. Um, most of the focus of the early Olympic dust mitigation program was just don't have impacts during construction. 
It wasn't about how you maintain and monitor habitat. So we talked about this. This is the during the development of the master project, we've had these other little phases. Uh, we have, we've had some of the, you guys saw the habitat islands. This is how they looked when they were first constructed. <laughs> wave wave action through uh, increased water surface just kind of flatten them out. But we still have habitat uh, next to them. Um, a couple other a couple other notes. Uh, this is an opening we'll visit this area where we talk about we have to have uh, recreation public access. Uh, there's kiosks to encourage people where to go, and then the the idea was to collaboratively collaboratively develop the plan for Owens Lake. Have something that's flexible, sustainable, but integrate as we've heard not only waterless measures but maintaining habitat value. Uh, try to build things as aesthetically as possible, protect cultural resources, um, and think about this is a good economic uh, opportunity for the county to have birders come through. So how do we how do we interface with that? All the while trying to reduce the amount of water um, on Owens Lake. So uh, I'm gonna there's some questions about how to tattoo the model. I figured so I put some some uh, slides together to kind of drill down on that. So before we model habitat, the idea was first, well, we just count the birds. The birds will tell us, right? Well, that's great. What if we don't show? How, what does that mean, right? Um, the other thing was it, the habitat was measured by the amount of water that went out. And that's, okay, habit, water is quite correlated, but it's not the only thing. So what are some of the other factors that are important for habitat? That's what went into the habitat model. So we, we incorporated all of the important habitat parameters, salinity, I mentioned water depth, islands, um, for each of these deals that we mentioned. So the idea was to have a flexible framework to how do you create this habitat? We inadvertently created it, but if you were to actually design habitat, you've got a lot of natural experiments to tell you not only in the literature, but on all these legs to say this is what they want. And so that was parameterized in the habitat model. That it gives you some ability to enhance areas if you if you so desire, um, and it's predictive, right? You ask a bird why it, you, you can't ask a bird why it likes an area, but you put this into the model, and you can understand if you build something in a certain way, you can understand how birds respond to it. So it's predictive to a very uh, a very important aspect of habitat suitability model. I'm sure you guys have all worked with biologists at one point or another. It is it can be a fairly subjective science. So this is a tool that was uh, collaboratively developed. I, I put this up here to emphasize this because it's a very important measuring stick of habitat that's out there. It's, uh, it's I need a couple other things. We developed it collaboratively with Eastern Sierra Audubon, Calvary Wildlife, uh, uh, California State Lands Commission, and we also had various um, experts in the field come out and offer peer review to make sure are we getting all the pieces um, together. Native Plant Society. Native Plant Society to get all the non-aquatic habitat. Um, and the other important point I want to make is it is meant to be intuitive. I, I'll, I'll tell you more um, later, but you, you don't have to have a background in multivariate statistics to understand how it works. So anyone who understands what Schrober's life can go, yeah, that makes sense. So I'll, I'll give you some examples here in a sec. Um, but I want to show you some photos of what is kind of enhanced habitat. The idea is you create islands, you nest foraging habitat next to roosting habitat. And so on the left there are a bunch of northern shovelers um, using these old remnant village islands that are, are great features. Um, on the right there, another idea is shallow water. Shallow water is, is what most of our birds prefer. So if you can grade a pond to make more shallow water, you can increase the habitat value. Oh, by the way, you can save water at the same time. Um, and at the bottom, um, uh, this is representing what we haven't really talked about, dynamic water management. These shorebirds that come through in fall, they come through in a non vest season. So uh, water is drying down, and it's a generally a pretty dry time period. But if you can add a little bit of water to maintain some of those inverts that are there before you dry down, you can have immense habitat value by just keeping not only are the inverts still there, they're often uh, they're often um, they're, escaping, uh, they're, they're concentrated. Thank you. 
uh, concentrated, so it's a great resource where, where you can put a little bit of water if you don't need it during the best season, targeted for the use of habitat. Um, so the overall goal is to use this, instead of not a water supply or a number of birds, but to use this model to understand habitat and integrate that idea. So you can you can understand what you need to do to manage for habitat targeting. Some of the habitat parameters we'll talk about. You, you, you want to create an area for water for water depth. The own the dust project, if you've done adaptive management plans, you're often going, I don't have enough leverage to pull. Owens like you can control virtually everything. Right? So you have a lot of things you can move. There are always constraints and there are but but you have way more than a lot of other projects. Um, so uh, but it's it's a model and, and so we have to have integrated monitoring and adaptive management to make sure it's it's coming forward. So our goal is to use the habitat model for creating habitat, but we still go out and count the birds and make sure that in terms of performance is it is it working. Um, I hit this in terms of predictive design habitat features. So what do you want to do if you want to enhance an area? The idea is if you enhance an area, you increase its habitat value. You're maintaining overall habitat value. You might have the same birds here, but a moderate or a marginal area you could dry up and do some water with. That is maintaining overall habitat value. Um, so I want to hit this last point um, <coughs> underscore it. This framework gives us that opportunity to do new waterless, water-efficient dust control measures. But we have to monitor them to understand how they impact habitat. And to make sure they're not, not just impacting habitat, but some of these things might have additional impact. So, so you know, whatever um, this panel recommends and whatever we move forward, one of the important points of all this collaboration is it can't be done in a vacuum. It has to be integrated to this overall framework. Um, so that's kind of a big picture. Uh, I have a little time. I wanted to go and talk a little bit about the habitat model. Um, so here's kind of on the right the conceptual way the habitat models put together: uh, water depth, salinity, water availability, habitat islands, topography, vegetation. Those are kind of key things. Those are all evaluated um, for each of our fields. The goal is it's, it's uh, essentially between zero of not good at all to one perfect. And so these are all mathematically integrated. This is the conceptual on the right. Um, but you use this model into manage, uh, run across various management areas. And so on the left there, those are our management areas. Those are our T designation CPA. So that's what the model is run across into these polygons. So here is the rule set of the model. Um, I, and I won't drill down into the nitty gritty details, but um, I'll, I'll mention the parameters if I can. So, the first one, water depth. These are all, this is why this is intuitive. Uh, if you know that snow clovers like shallow water and 0 to 10 centimeters, if you can understand that this is, this is telling you um, 0 is not very worthwhile, 1 is as good as it gets. So, hey, the model says shallow water is what clovers like. Salinity. Through monitoring, we know what, what salinity, uh, the invert community that voters like. So this is kind of a moderate salinity. They don't like fresh, they don't like super stinky water. Seasonal water availability, they breed here. They generally leave in the fall, in the open winter elsewhere. Water in the fall, they could care less. Water in the spring when they're breeding, very important. Uh, dry area, that's important for nesting. Microtopographic relief, they like relief that is about the same size as them. Kind of camouflage them. So that is an important parameter in my topography. And vegetated extent, they like, they obviously don't like vegetation. Too much vegetation, they leave the area. So that's the intuitive part. The, we've done a lot of uh, uh, running the models since 2010, um, and we have a lot of bird data. And so using that, the first model was very expert based. We've done two, you know, three iterations now. And so a lot of the, the the multivariate modeling is to how do you combine all these variables? What is most important? And so this is the, the equation currently for the snow globe and habitat model. It uses a geometric mean, um, the dry area and water depth, they're not you know, really average and they don't make up for each other. The geometric mean um, helps balance that out. Uh, the 
Salinity, water depth and water availability are kind of combined. Salinity is the most important part of this. And then the other one, the microtopographic release, that you stand in dry area, those are all more nesting, um, nesting variables and then they're combined. So this model can be run um, at various time points, understanding what the lake is doing, and, uh, and it, it can be run on all of these different areas that you have in monitoring all of them. So when you do that, you can understand the habitat value, and then on the left there, that's showing the, the habitat value of each of these polygons during a like an average that was in 2012 and 2014. And so it's an older map, so some of these areas didn't exist that even are good. But yellow areas, low marginal habitat, darker is better, and then the really brown is kind of optimal. So you can show, hey, these are good. Uh, these are areas that are good for clovers. And then we want to check, do clovers, this did not make sense, do clovers see them along the way we see it? And so this is one of the uh, last validation uh, we're predicting about 45% of the clover abundance based on, on this model. Um, physical science, maybe not the best, but it's pretty amazing to think five variables out of the almost infinite things that clovers could key in on, you're predicting a, a substantial amount of why a clover exists in the area. Um, we do that for all the guilds, so just we'll put the validation here um, on the other guilds. Migrating shorebirds, all those shorebirds we mentioned. Um, it, the model performs even better for, for those for those gills. Um, so on the left, migrating shorebirds, 69% of the variation is predicted. Again, um, and in mesh, so this is from the x-axis natural log, this is log transform habitat value, and then the abundance on the on the y. So 69% for migratory shorebirds, and then migrating waterfowl about 75%. So the habitat model predicts their abundance based on pack elevation of 75%. So, um, I just want to leave with uh, a couple photos of wildlife. Uh, we talk about the common birds, but people are always interested in the, in the berries. So I'll put a couple of berries up there. Um, everything from flamingos to crested caracaras to visit the Owens Lake. Owens Lake is a bit of a, uh, Inyo County is known for getting the oddball bird, uh, probably second to Death Valley. It just, particularly water birds, it is, it is lost. Somewhere and, and end up in own way. So, um, yeah, and we have other, uh, I put other non birds in here, and birds are the reason Owens Lake is well known, but um, bats, uh, the juice in the areas in the hills around us, uh, undoubtedly forage over Owens Lake. Uh, we have birds that, like peregrine falcons on the left there, that take advantage of all the, the great feasting of small, of small birds. Um, Here's a, an invert that is kind of interesting. Tiger needles, very common here. Uh, that's our crested caracara. Normally doesn't make it up to, to Indian County. I think this is the Indian County record uh, due occur in Texas. In the Seasman Springs, we have amphibians. Um, they're not salt tolerant, but the, the Seasman Springs are pretty fresh. And then we, uh, I think Mike mentioned lizards. Uh, this is not a, a sidewalk lizard, it's actually a desert iguana. Um, I found it, if someone were to told me my background. There's a desert one on the lake, I would look crazy, but I, so I, it, 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 the only thing I can tell is it was brought in in a pile of wood cracks <coughs> and, and deposited out of the lake. And then here's our uh, feral uh, flamingo that came out. It, it's the deep flamingo that originally from Africa. So if it didn't get here, I had some power, so we just take that. But it hung out for me, <laughs> hanging out with adults. It was kind of, it, uh, it was interesting and in that we didn't. The first time I saw it, I thought, I saw a flamingo, like, stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we didn't play him, but sure enough, it was a lesser flamingo. Um, so yeah, he's kind of famous around the And um, with that, great, thank you. Questions from the panel? Yeah, so when you implement this model, how do you weigh the different uh, fields of birds to determine mix of habitats? So, um, the SQL house is out there, and when you start a project, there's a SQL baseline of what is there at the time of an LP, right? So, what, so the way we use the model now is what was there at the time of the start of the project. And so, it's maintaining how does that value get there at the start of the project. And so, the habitat model is a tool. How much is there? 
there's this much value, we're going to recreate it in whatever way. And so we've used it in, in many different ways. I think the only one we drilled down, drilled down on in the field was the tillage back and backup project, where we, we do create that habitat in, in different ways um, in kind of enhance certain areas to, to maintain maintain the habitat value of them. So are you going to adjust this? Because when you first started the project, I viewed the habitat value on the lake was at its minimum. Yeah, on the lake, very little. Um, the season springs are what had habitat value. So um, the, 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 we call it the reference period. Right before the NOP master project, um, that's kind of sets where we're at baseline. But that's kind of a policy thing. Where should the baseline be? I guess so it's a bit of an open question. But the idea is you can maintain how does that value do this reference period using that, that tool of the how does that model? What's the time period you're talking about? Uh, the, the reference period we've been using is uh, 12 through 14. And that's a time where we've had a lot of data uh, to really understand how does that value during that time. Other questions? Yeah, I know this is very far end point, but another thing in restoration we usually use as a reference point is the impact in the system. So it seems like based on this model, the shallow water is really important. So is that suggesting that Owens Lake pre drawing down water wouldn't have been very supportive of some of these skills that way? Well, um, pre, you know, Owens Lake, historical size of Owens Lake. I, I don't know. I, I mean, yeah, I, I can't answer that. All, all it, we're doing is looking at what's out there with us. Well, we have the we have the the some field notes in Grinnell, um, but they're they're anecdotal. They're not really uh, quantitative. They're beautiful to read. They're, they're very short, about five lines. 1911, 1913. I guess some of the ones you included in the packet gave a very good sense of quantity. So, uh, maybe I wasn't reading it with that in mind. Were there different guilds that were important than the guilds that the lake was putting out? They're about the same species. Okay. Basically. Okay. Um, I would say, and I don't know Jeff, what you just said, but uh, there may be more habitat out there now with the best project. There's one historically on the lake, other than the deep water type things for dreams. Yeah, that's what I was just trying to get. Some the model was good. suggesting that to me, so I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. And we have one percent of the world's habitats passed through here. Uh, one percent of the world's leaks and pipes passed through here. Huge population. Of the, of the Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm going to try to answer your question first. <laughs> um, I, I mean, how are those how are those multivariate um, equations produced where you essentially Trying to make the best progression through that line that you showed, or was there some other? So that was just a validation. How they were um, a lot of uh, like the cart trees from from multiple regressions trying to hold each other in a variable constant, but it's there's there's always interaction and it, it's a, a process. Um, we had point wheel help. A little bit. They're plenty of conservation science. They're kind of short lived persons. Uh, there's a report out there if you, you want to look at that. They, yeah. They, yeah. 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 All right. <clears throat> but that, now the other, I mean, so obviously the first district is part of this district. So, um, so and I, I guess they're mostly flies, right? So they, so you don't have to worry about how they have connectivity between pools. So, um, do you do any monitoring of those and it, some of the failures to have birds there because for some reason there's no food there? There's been a lot of work on what environmental parameters do invertebrates respond to. And so those are part of the model salinity and this water availability stability thing. The idea is there, we understand what the invertebrates are responding to, and so the parameters. We're not out there measuring inverts, we're me measuring the, the habitat parameters inverts are responding to as well. Out by size five, Jeff provides the Goldilocks water for them. I'm not too fresh, not too, not too salty. 
natives. Yeah, it's true. For instance, they can't jump one across another. <laughs> no, um, they they can't. But it's odd. I don't. I don't know. If I fully understand it either. They're in all the ponds. Um, they do uh, reading up on them. Um, they are the cysts. They they insist that are very tolerant of heat and drying out. So the cysts float. So they're kind of adapted to getting up in feathers. So they move around. So once you have them in a pond and and they, they call it out yeah. We, we've recently shown that uh, brine shrimp can be transported to Aeolian. And blown, yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the work that we've done at um, Fowler was to get mono by uh, Margaret Connecticut. Well, she's the University of Connecticut. Long term anthologist. She found that brine flies were the primary food to them, so they're certain in, third in star of their pupae. Um, and that the brine shrimp, um, they would literally starve to death on if they ate, if they actually fed some of the shallows brine shrimp, and where they just ate and ate and ate and still first would die of starvation. And so the tremendous richness of the, of the brine flies, at least in particular to, to the shallows, uh, was, was critical. Um, I need to read my go for brine. Brian shrimp, they can also have a, they can, ex, if they get stressed, they can extend their, their intestine, they can go along their intestine and deal with trying to get the maximum amount of nutrition out of marginal uh, food sources. So then I guess it doesn't matter. So there's a, there is, I'm not wrong with you thinking, there is a funny mismatch between what's considered the dust season and when you have to have water don't have to have water and when the birds would like to use water particularly in late summer and fall. It's pretty close, right? The dust season uh, we're ending July, August, September. Um, waterfowl works out well. They start really coming in uh, September, October. But the early shoreward migration is where it is in this country. And that's where we do this uh, dynamic water management project. Uh, we've been trying to Pull water off areas that aren't emitted during the fall. And then we can use some of that water to make up habitat value. And water is super important because it's so dry. Uh, so you can really maintain and enhance habitat value by pulling that water tar to target it if you that, that wouldn't make much. Right. Seasonal water. So there's some effort to fill that hole. Simply, right. that's well, the first. Water from the Indian dust. So, yeah. there was a question earlier about uh, habitat, uh, global warming, and uh, there was a comment about declines in habitat species and birds. How does the model account for that? Is something I, I want to know as well. Well, so the way there's, I guess, two parts to answer. One is that the in short, it doesn't need to. All you can control is the habitat and the whether the bird, there's a, a hundred birds or a thousand birds, that's dependent on so many other parts. Um, so when you, when you validate, you have to understand that. But the only thing you have to control is the habitat of the bit, and that's what the model measures. <clears throat> so the bigger picture is the model can be used in whatever way. If we, we globally sort of want to target other things that are more, that are more threatened elsewhere, we can use that model to understand, okay, we need to produce more of that habitat. Is that is the goal. So that's so how it's used is a, is, is a larger question. But it, it's an opportunity if we, if we need to to sort of think about um, how we might implement it. But in essence, we're not worried about bird counts, right? We're just worried about what we control and how does that happen. Other questions from Pam? So just to follow up with that, but from that perspective, it can be used as scenario planning for we've got another five year drought period and you can't keep this much area shallow flooded. Right. They can tell you maybe where the priority area is to flood for habitat would be or something like that. Yeah, it can be used in, in any number of ways on what is the best area. If you if you really and so the question I think Phil is um, all you have to keep everything in dust control, so that, that might not be an, an option, but there's definitely ways to think about 
how to prioritize if you need to. Uh, we have Stephanie uh, Cardo. Oh, okay. So I'm trying to understand how this applies on an aerial basis. So if a habitat suitability index tells you have that quality per acre, and then do you, in, in a planning, can you walk us through scenarios? Like say they decide you want to move to tillage, which is a very low habitat, then do you back calculate out how to maximize that set somewhere else to get a baseline <coughs> that index across the total acreage. And, and, and for bird habitat, do we know that you need to have a certain amount of acreage, or is it really you have high quality small areas versus moderate quality large areas? I'm trying to yeah. understand acreage here. So we got, I think there's, there's two kind of questions there. One is how is that acreage and one is like I, I think I heard how far can you squeeze in the habitat value that you need, right? Okay. So um uh, the acreage is, is like the index value of an acreage. So you we kind of use this term of value acreage, right? It's quantity times quality, right? So you can get how much value is in an area. But you're doing it by polygon, and so you can we have our I should you all the polygons. So the, the polygons are these DCMs that are sort of management units. And so we, we do it within that within those. You can still divide them. So generally, a project is four DCMs or something, and uh, we want to save as much water as possible. And so we use that model to say, well, given we know how much is there, how do you recreate that with less area? And you, you iteratively run the model to kind of maximize the habitat value. And remember, the model is empirically derived, so it's 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 kind of set on what you've observed. So you generally don't have the option of kind of like over like saying this is oh yeah yeah I'm totally going to get a thousand birds in this square inch it's, it's empirically derived so if you were to really maximize the value like you're set on a, on a what is measured in the past right and so um, if you maximize everything to one well that might be conceptual that's kind of a small if you do if you do the math and you have 0.3, you maximize everything to a one, that's a small area and still maintaining the habitat value. Generally, one is completely conceptual. It's generally not feasible to create. But that's how to address the second part of your question, kind of what is enough or what is yeah, how how much you can do. Can you give this a project by project scale or like what? So is that we're thinking of? So in the past, well, so I'm in the all I have is kind of in the past, but uh -huh. the project is going forward isn't fully developed. So I'm answering this in the past. Is we have kind of a project area, these are the goals, this is what we can do, and we use that to find um, we'll talk a little bit about how we do that phase seven A. It's very what TWD squared kind of a thing. So you have all these factors in your project and can use it within that framework. The idea is to do that in some way lake wide, but doing these little smaller projects kind of in a lake wide context. Yeah. Other questions from the panel? Well, so I guess that was really the question. I would I expand on that a little. You could use this concept to look at, at, at significant changes across the entire lake as far as water management. And use this. But you haven't done that yet. You've been using it on a, on kind of a plot scale or a project scale so far. There has been planning efforts. Um, to, to look at how what, what is feasible, how this might be used like what. I need to present some of those results. I think I, I, I don't remember I saw this presentation, but I've seen things in the past that kind of show you know some op options. So we we've been looking at how that might be used. I want to add to that. Uh, oh, there's uh, <clears throat> one of the things we noticed in our analysis is that when I was first introduced to this concept on a lake wide scale, it almost sounds like I can do anything anywhere as long as I meet certain physical parameters. So the number of uh, options I have for dust control area are pretty high, 30, depending on how you want to do your mosaics. Um, but that's not the reality. Um, There's certain DCA dust control areas that have, uh, are better suited, or the followers are already there. and. Uh, not good to 
change that to tillage and then change their put their home somewhere else. That, that so it limits my options. If you're doing uh you're trying to do look at all your options, a DCA all of a sudden DCA that has good forward, it's often not limited to forward types of changes there. So this is the way I think about it, there's less risk if you're just trying to enhance what's already good than if you're trying to go to um, get rid of it and recreate it over here. There's a lot more risk than that. Because you I mean we know a lot, but we never know that. Right. So do you have right, it's probably mostly in your head because that's how we all do that, but do you have some more of uh, notes on say, that decision tree in your head of the first thing to look at at a site to figure out what your options are? Well, I, I, we have notes. Um, we look at, we talk to operations, make them, they know what works well, where. Um, so they give us their highest, what you absolutely should do, their recommendation, and what you should never do in that area. They know that some of the areas are not the candidates for tillage. Then we talk to just who, what do you see in, you know, we go DCA by DCA. What do you think should happen here? What do you think? Then we look at the aging infrastructure. Then we look at cost. Um, and we actually use uh, the habitat suitability model to predict where we're going to end up with, with the project. And we're able to estimate water conservation, the three legs of the stool, you know, make sure they're all there. Um, and we ran hundreds of iterations to be able to develop the project. So that's the best I can answer I can give you. Right how, how often is that process done? Um, we ran two iterations last week, you know. So it's, I mean, it's not a good process. It, it is. is. Have you used this to begin to think about impacts of water list control measures? Water is a big factor in your habitat. I, I just wonder how far, I know you're thinking about doing it, but I mean, yeah. how. Yeah, no, it's used with the TV2 project that was designed to save water over roughly 2,000 acres and make it waterless. And so, yeah, um, yeah, so you measure how much that habitat value is out there. Remember that we talked about that one of the, um, the ideas of what DCAs are chosen is they're relatively low habitat value. Less habitat value you make up, more potential water saving. And so those are the areas that were targeted and then you understand what's there and you, you iteratively find out how how much water water based dust control you need to make up for the habitat value for the bridge there. And how did you make it up? Uh, uh, with two DCAs, there's about four hundred or so acres of the four square miles that was redesigned to maximize enhance its habitat value. So I have some questions that haven't been answered yet. So um, what do you know about the suitability of different types of vegetation for uh, the habitat? So if you look at putting in different types of vegetation, what do you know about what would be best for maximizing the suitability? Um, yeah, so I didn't talk about the alkaline meadow habitat model, uh, but we have uh, the Society helped design that. There's a ranch of Sianna. Side restoration cooking. So, um, the four components um, cover is obviously an important one. The, uh, the structure, the height, uh, is important for uh, for nesting birds and, and different trophic levels or trophic levels of nesting. More species, they, we rank based on the number of species in there. Uh, as you get more species, you get, um, you get flowering plants, you get um, Nectar for for alkali skipper, um, and then uh, the fourth one is uh, owns like it's pretty flat, and so this is based on um, California and California rapid assessment tool was some measure of topographic diversity. But instead of being flat, the more topographic diversity, the more opportunity for burrowing animals, things like that. So those are all integrated in. The one I think you were doing, I guess there's two and. Uh, species diversity and structure. And so those are incorporated. The more diverse, the more structure, those are rates based on kind of how much you can do. So um, that goes into the, the, 
to have that model. Do you see any inherent conflict when we just draw one potentially for you? Mm -hmm. Things you said earlier was, I believe, because a flower doesn't particularly like plants a lot taller than it is. It wants something about its own size. Yet, if we think about dust control, one of the objectives is, well, if the plant's taller, you have a bigger wind shadow and better dust control with lower plant cover. Are, are those types of, uh, uh, of conflicts uh, common or rare? Well, I mean, you can't make every yield happy at the same time. So there's, there's that kind of balance. Um, if you're going for outdoor meadow, I guess the, we've got, in, in the framework we have with trying to maintain what's out there, we have significantly more of this alkaline meadow vegetation out there. So the framework we're working on, we don't need any more to sort of maintain what's out there. So the vegetation is really, uh, and it was used this way in kind of phase 7a, a water conservation dust control. Because it, it, it owns like kind of the limiting factor of what you need to maintain are water-based dust control for shortage of water power. We have a lot more vegetation than was than was out there, so it would be a great, great, uh, great dust control. But the guilds that are kind of limiting, they don't use it necessarily. Uh, the other thing that I, I wasn't just I just wasn't clear on was the issue of adjacency of different types of habitat. So not just the continuity of habitat over large chunks area, but adjacency of different types. Of Habitat. Does that go into the planning at all, or do you see that in the future? We played with kind of how you might do that. Um, it never came out in, in something that's modeled, so it's it kind of an extra model parameter. Um, but the idea is you do want to put, you don't want to put a habitat in the desert of like nothingness, right? So you do want to try to think about clumping those things together, and that very much has been part of the Other questions from the panel? Yes. Yeah, um, and I'm glad you reminded me of this because it's something I was thinking about when we were out there. You, so you said the vegetated area, the water setting that is the, the control of dust is sort of you know, there, you're not looking at managing it too accurately. But I, I mean, it's also sort of monocultural. I'm sort of, I'm wondering if there's any thought actually improving that, that value of vegetated area. We're going to Sorry. We're going to visit an area where we really did that uh, okay. to try to increase uh, not just the, the, the model and what the four outline meadow, the diversity and the structure, but try to integrate it into next to ponds wherever possible. You can even use gravel in, in ways that if it's not a monoculture of gravel, you can integrate gravel as kind of um, an area that uh, is adjacent to foraging habitat. It could be a recent area. So trying to integrate these dust control measures that can be difficult to manage, but it was an effort to try to put all these pieces together to increase diversity while still having kind of the, the functions of those dust controls. Um, Questions from the panel members in the room? Uh, anything from uh, Venky on the phone? No? The question was, how does the Audubon Society view dust control benefits that avoid the use of water? Uh, and I think actually, um, Mr. Norton sort of gave the answer. The answer is that um, we're not opposed to that in any way. Uh, water doesn't necessarily equate with habitat, as I think it was pointed out earlier. There are areas of the lake that have a lot of water that don't have a lot of suitable habitat. So we have absolutely no problem removing water from those areas because they don't impact habitat. The, the point is that the, the initial development of habitat as the dust control project rolled out was, was purely incidental. It was just a side effect the, from the, the use of, of water to control dust. There's a big difference between that kind of incidental side effect and a more managed effect or consequence of using water. We think that if you're more mindful in the way that you use water to sustain habitat, 
that you can realize some significant water savings without having to do damage to the habitat. It's just that it never happened before. It wasn't thought of initially until it was kind of a new concept uh, to apply to the lake. But, but we are not of the opinion that because there was water put here once, it has to be put here forever or in the same quantity or at the same time. This is uh, an unfolding kind of story. It used to make me crazy when we talked about this to begin with, that, that I wanted this to be talked about in terms of a, a natural place. And it took me a long time to recognize that the fact that it was the very opposite of that was the biggest lever that we had in terms of figuring out an answer uh, to, to a, a future for the lake. There were so many things that were managed that instead of worrying about the fact that they were managed, the idea was to worry about how they were managed and for what purpose and to do that in the most mindful way we could. I think there's a huge amount of promise to that, um, that we're just barely beginning to scratch the surface of. Thank you. Final thoughts from the panel. All right, well, we are right on time. Uh, and so we're scheduled for a 15 minute break, and then we'll come back for a presentation at the top of the hour at 3 o'clock. So uh, let's see if you need next. And thank you to all. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's reconvene and uh, begin with uh, our uh, final speaker of the day. Um, or we'll hear about potential. Uh, climate impact from uh, Teresa Kim of the uh, LA Department of Water and Power. So, uh, Kim, the floor is yours. And we can't hear any audio. Hi, this is Teresa Kim from uh, Water Resources Development. Great, we can hear you now. Okay. I don't know who was. So, is the PowerPoint loaded on everyone's oh, end? Just yeah. And we can see your uh, title slide. Hmm? Okay, great. So, um, I'm going to provide you a brief overview of um, strictly the climate change studies that we've done at DWP and other studies that's related to the Eastern Sierra that we're studying. Um, in order to, with our objective, is to help plan for water resource development uh, for the city. So just some quick background to start off. Um, our area of interest that we're looking at is not the whole Sierra Nevada watershed. It's strictly on only the Eastern Sierra because this watershed is what feeds uh, water to our LA aqueduct and that uh, provides water over to the city of Los Angeles. Um, a few studies that, we're, that I'm going to be speaking about today is back in 2011, DWP completed a climate change study on the whole Eastern Sierra with our consultant TetraTech. Um, they spent two years of looking at data from the later half of the 20th century. So basically from 1950 to 2009, they collected historical data and um, applied that to um, the global climate models and greenhouse emissions um, that were available back then in order to determine the projections in um, precipitation and temperature um, that would affect over the next, um, this century, the 21st century. Um, I'm also going to look at the latest UCLA um, study that was conducted um, in 2018. And that one's a little different because it looks at the whole Sierra Nevada area. And then um, also, I'll give you guys a quick update. We're in the process of working with UCLA again to update that 2011 study we did with Tetra Tech because of all the changes that has occurred over the last 10 years. We need to see if um, modeling, current modeling and the latest science that's available today would um, confirm 
those predictions and projections that I'll be talking about today, or it's going to um, show us what the changes are and how we have to alter our planning processes. So um, this is the data that Tetra Tech was looking at. So over the course of 50 years, um, temperature was taken at different locations in the Sierra Nevada um, watershed area. And so if you look at the area that's circled, that's the average taken over 1,000 meters to 3,500 um, meters. And temperatures range from about, um, let's see, temperatures range from about zero degrees Celsius to about 16 degrees Celsius. So this is the baseline I'm gonna use when I talk about the projections that we see over the 21st century after modeling was conducted. And also this is the precipitation that they use in their modeling as well. Um, from the same elevation range, the precipitation range from about zero uh, centimeters to about approximately 100 centimeters. And this is also the baseline that we use in our projections as well. And so one more quick overview that I provide right here is um, with those temperature and precipitation in a historical period, this is um, a representation of the amount of runoff that was <clears throat> seen over in Owens Valley. So we have here the pattern of basically um, a couple years of wet years. So the average you see is 100%. Anything above that is extreme wet and anything below that is dry to drought years. So our extreme wet was back in 1969. That's about uh, 800 to 900,000 acre feet per year. And our extreme dry was about 210. And also we see here that when we have dry, we have it for consistent years of about four to five years. And um, it shows us in our latest dry years from about 2012 to 2015, we only got about 200 acre feet of, of runoff through the Owens Valley. So with that information, um, we were able to apply that data into um, the Tetra Tech 2011 study. So the study period that our objective, like I said, was we wanted to see what the temperature precipitation runoff was going to occur over the 21st century. So from 2010 to um, 2099, we used 16 global climate models that was available back then, applied the two extreme greenhouse gas emission, which was the A2, uh, carbon uh, equivalent and the B1. So B1 is the lower end and A2 was the extreme end. Um, that available model was used into the variable infiltration capacity model and then applied integrated into the LASM, which is the DWP um, aqueduct model in order to see how much runoff was going to be flowing through um, the aqueduct. So with that information, um, here again, I'm showing you the different emissions that were available to us, and we only picked the A2 model. So A2 is about 830 parts per million uh, per volume of carbon dioxide, and B1, as you can see, is the green one all the way at the bottom. So we're applying two measures to uh, the global climate models, so the 16 global climate models, to see what the um, extreme conditions we would we would get. And so this is the result that we get. So we break it down into three segments over the 21st century. So um, the first segment is from 2010 to 2039. Um, the middle is 2040 to 2069. And then the end range of the 21st century is 2070 to 2099. So um, I'm taking, I'm showing you the extreme temperature, which is the A2 greenhouse gas emission model. And the temperature basically increases up to 4.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the 21st century. So um, that basically correlates to, for every two degrees we see an increase of temperature, um, we're getting snowpack um, decreases in about 20% to up to 50%. So in the first century, we're not seeing much temperature increase. But as you hit the middle from 2040 to 2069, you're going to get about two degrees of uh, temperature increase. 
and four degrees as we um, head towards the later half of the 21st century. And so when you get towards the later half, you're going to see up to about 33% to uh, up to 33 to 50% of snowpack reduction by the end of the 21st century. Um, what that also correlates to is precipitation. So we took that data and um, you can see the range of the precipitation, which is about 600 uh, millimeters. But over time, we're graphing all the global climate models as seen here. Um, over time, by the end of the 21st century, we get a decrease of up to 10% in precipitation. So in the beginning of the 21st century, we're not gonna see much going on. But by 2040, we're gonna see about 5% decrease in precipitation. And by the end from 2070 to 2099, we're gonna to get to see up, up to 10% in precipitation. And in terms of precipitation, I think what we're gonna see more is because of the uh, warming and um, temperature increases, we're gonna see more rain than snow um, at higher elevations. And that would definitely affect our runoff. So here it is, what I'm talking about is the rain to snow ratio. So the rain to snow ratio we see is gonna tremendously increase because um, like I said, we're gonna see higher amount of rainfall than snow due to the temperature and um, earlier runoff as well. So for taking, um, as we're staying upon the A2 greenhouse gas emission scenario, um, if you take a look at the time graph from 1950 to 2010, that's our average runoff. Um, that's shown in the red line, which is the historical Owens Valley runoff. Um, and our projections from 2010 to 2099, runoff has tremendously decreased because um, you're seeing um, more rain and it gets, um, and it's being stored less. And then um, we also see losses due to evaporation as well. Okay, so this is a summary of what I explained to you among the three graphs so far. So the historical baseline that we looked at was from 1950 to 2090, from 2009, um, we're seeing about 620 um, acre feet of water a year. And as we progress, as uh, the temperature increases, you see how much the runoff is tremendously decreased over time because of um, the snow and runoff ratio. So precipitation um, is being decreased from zero to up to 10% by the end of the 21st century. And um, the temperature again goes from zero degrees to up to five degrees increase by the end of the 21st century. Okay. So overall, to summarize it again, so we're seeing up to, um, I was speaking in Celsius, so in comparison, um, that's about four degrees Celsius, translates to about almost eight degrees uh, Fahrenheit warming by the end of the 21st century. We're seeing about 50% up to 50% loss in snowpack, but that doesn't occur right now. That doesn't occur until about the later half of the 21st century. And then, um, Due to the higher warming levels that we see, we're going to get more rain and less snow. So um, there's a less opportunity for us to actually take that water and use it. Um, and then we also beginning to see that the snow is melting much earlier. We see shifting in about up to 25 days for a month um, compared to before where it would melt about, um, I would say about in March or April, we're seeing snow begin to melt around February. So what uh, challenges that happens to us is now we also have to deal with um, trying to store the water, where do we place the water. Um, that also affects the water quality as there's more water that's being um, conveyed down and flooding capacities of the aqueduct. And um, it also affects um, the power system that's part of us because there's 12 uh, small hydro systems that's along the aqueduct and it generates about 4,700 kilowatt per hour. So as we see um, less runoff that's going to be occurring, the power system will also be losing power as well. 
So there's many challenges that comes with all these major changes, as we can see with different um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions that we're applying in the modeling. So like I was speaking about before, we have many operational challenges. Again, um, we have higher runoff, like last in the latest wet year of 2017, we had about 800,000 acre feet of water that was being conveyed down for us and we didn't know where to store that water. And then we're also dealing with extreme dry years where we only get about a quarter of that amount and it only is about 200 acre feet of water. And when we have dry years, we have it from a consecutive two to four years of dry year. And when we have wet years, we see it in patterns of only about two years for every decade that we have on hand. So another study that we've been looking at um, was this latest study that was completed by UCLA and it was published in 2018. They didn't specifically look at the um, Eastern Sierra like that was our interest. They looked at the whole Sierra Nevada region and their purpose and their study was to see what the latest greenhouse gas um, emissions were and what their impact was um, similar to us on temperature, snowpack and the runoff. Um, their studies and their findings basically conclude that if there wasn't going to be any greenhouse um, emission mitigations like what we have with the Paris climate or trying to meet, you know, current regulations like AB32 and what the city is trying to do is reduce our greenhouse emissions is if we don't reduce that at all, um, we're going to see increase of temperatures of up to 7 degrees um, Fahrenheit and we're going to see snowpack reductions of 64% and a shift in snowpack about 50 days. So the, this study that UCLA conducted um, sort of clearly fits with our 2011 climate study. So our climate study um, determined that it was going to be about 8 degrees Fahrenheit and their study determined 7 degrees. So it's pretty close in temperature increase. And then um, as far as the 64% percent reduction in snowpack, um, we, our study showed about 50% reduction. So the numbers are pretty close in saying that snowpack reduction is going to decrease up to at minimum 50% by the end of the 21st century. And um, as far as the shift in snowmelt, this one for UCLA, UCLA shows 50 days. For our study, it shows 25 days. So there's double the amount um, at least. So there's a saying that snowmelt's gonna occur at least two months ahead, where ours is about one month ahead. And um, their study is also looking at higher elevations. Our study capped our height at the Eastern Sierra about 3,500. They're looking at it uh, all the way up to the Tahoe region, which reaches about 8,000 feet. Um, so with both of these studies that we have already in our pocket, uh, what you feel, what DWP is doing so far is we've contracted and we're working with UCLA to basically, they'll take their Sierra Nevada study and they're going to um, zoom in on the regional section of the Eastern Sierra and see what they can find out for us to see um, if they can apply the latest greenhouse emissions and the latest global climate models and see what predictions they have to either confirm our 2011 climate change study or to update it and show us um, what the trend is. Is there going to be higher levels of temperature and higher precipitation? Um, are we going to have, are we going to see the same results that we see in 2011? So um, overall, we can tell from all the studies that's been going on that um, with greenhouse gas emissions and if um, that we're going to get um, a decrease in snowpack in extreme years. We're going to get more rain and less snow. And near the end of the 21st century, we might see longer periods of drought. So that would be about four to five years of extreme drought. And on Owens Lake, when we saw extreme drought, we saw about 200 acre feet of water that was run off through that region. So we're going to see that again, or we're going to have um, a lower uh, amount of runoff over those years. So um, overall than that, I think most studies have confirmed that, you know, the climate conditions are impacted by um, the greenhouse gas. And um, it's only with the latest science that we can 
hone down and see what exactly that temperature is and what that runoff is that's going to affect um, us in planning for the future of our water resources. Okay, so that concludes um, my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that um, you might have. Thank you. Uh, let's turn to Ted Ruffel for uh, the first question. So uh, it could be a question for you or other people in this room. So you've got the results of these studies. Um, how are you integrating them in terms of your dust control planning and just the long-term resources here and how, you, how they're going to integrate this in general management of the resources up here? I, I can answer that, Rita, if you wanted to time it as well as well. So the way it's tied um, to dust control is the, the fact that we, uh, the overall goal for the department is to have a sustainable water future. Uh, currently, a large percentage of the water that uh, water demand for Los Angeles is meant by procurement of water from a metropolitan water district, and that water comes from uh, the Northern Delta, the Big Water Project, or Colorado River. So. We need to reduce. We're, we're in the process of reducing our dependency on that, trying to enhance our local water resource supplies. Now, part of that, expanding our portfolio, is here at Owens Lake, trying to conserve water here at Owens Lake, um, and that, that's roughly the how it ties into that. There's obviously a big effort in downtown that has already been undertaken to conserve water as part of the portfolio. Uh, and to expand our resources with the stormwater capture uh, and groundwater pumping, but it's still uh, to meet our goals or uh, you know our, our state requirements and our, our local requirements to conserve water. We we have to continue trying to conserve water here at all. But the so the timing uh, issues don't present any other management concerns or possibilities. Timing uh, of runoff and snow melt and rain. Yes, so it, it does. Um, so if you're very specific to that, we are seeing, um, we've gotten lucky in 2017 and this year, um, we're seeing uh, our, our, our winters kind of shorten and shrink. Um, the best thing for the department would be to have a prolonged winter where uh, the snowpack can melt gradually and can be conveyed in the aqueduct. Uh, the aqueduct has a certain capacity. If all of a sudden we get high temperatures uh, and more rain um, on the on the snowpack we have, then we'll have a, a tremendous peak flow that cannot be handled by our aqueduct. Uh, and and what we've done and learned in 2017 and even this this winter was that we have to maximize, the, we, we pretty much fill up all of our reservoirs in anticipation of it early. Um, and then we maximize the deliveries uh, down the aqueduct. The very next thing is to spread as much water in the Owens Valley uh, to replenish uh, groundwater aquifers. Um, and whatever is left over, and luckily in both years, there was not much left over. The rest would come down to uh, the lake. Um, in 2017, our projections were, without anticipating what we could spread in the valley, <clears throat> we were anticipating up to 200,000 acre feet uh, of potential snow, snow melt uh, runoff coming down to the river and a peak of about 1,200 CFS to 1,500 CFS coming at the, at the lake at once which put a lot of the infrastructure in jeopardy. We did hydraulic modeling with the help of CH Spring Hill that showed what parts of the lake would be inundated and underwater. So uh, in response to that, we, we protected key infrastructure. Um, we put riprap in some of the bottlenecks, reinforced berms, protected our pump station. Um, we made a massive effort, but we learned a lot from 2017 to 2018. We had a better understanding of how much we could actually spread. And we know that the, the severity of what we thought was once a 30 or 50 year storm event was 
could be managed more easily because uh, we knew we could spread about 150,000 acre feet to 200,000 in, in the actual valley, um, which leaves very little to come, come to the lake and uh, impact. Um, as you may know, I might have mentioned this in an earlier presentation, um, the landowners, the state, and we indemnify the mining company that is right next to the brine pool. Uh, meaning we cannot flood their operations and we cannot flood the brine pool. So we're really not allowed to allow the, and, and we have to maintain our dust mitigation obligations. So anything that puts those things at risk, at risk is something we just can't do. So those are some of the key points there. Let's go to Scott Tyler, then Valerie, then Greg. Okay, thanks. Thank you for the, the presentation, uh, sorry, uh, Teresa. So I guess I just want to sort of keep following up on what Ivan was, was, was saying, or I mean, sorry, um, this idea that sort of a 10% reduction in precipitation is not unexpected for the end of the end of the century. That's pretty common from what I've seen from Northern California as well. So the, the whole Sacramento River uh, Delta system will see that as well. Um, it's not a huge number, and 10% reduction is not a, it's not enormous, but it's pretty specific. But but this whole thing about timing, I think, is is a drama that um, that the, the department has to deal with. So so what? So so you're able to spread this year and previous or two years ago. What's the mechanism to get that spread water back into the into the canal, into the aqueduct? Later in the season, when you'll need the water, so is, is there is there planning forward? Both and I'm looking at I and also to, to Teresa. Is there a long-term strategy for managing earlier runoff in the valley and storage in the valley? <clears throat> I don't have a good answer for that, to be honest with you. Maybe Jeff, you, you deal more with watershed issues along the valley. Do you know more? Someone by I, I can't speak the long-term strategy, but I, when you spread that, it comes back. I think with Dr. Durat can probably answer your, your question and, um, more thoroughly than I could ever. It would seem like using the valley as the, as the new reservoir, but including or, and pumping that groundwater back out or pulling out and getting it into the river can probably pump the groundwater as much and you can control when you get it back into the yeah, we got later on. Yeah, no, that's not going on right now. Yeah. Um, that's as far as long term how that might change. Um, yeah, frankly. Because I think that's important with respect to managing the dust control here significantly and how, how that early runoff is handled. <clears throat> so, um, just on that, the, I mentioned some of the canals were built pre PWP. Those were put in service to spread. Okay. So we have McDowell's up in up for the bishop that spreads way way out across the legal fans and then two on the east side of the uh, that we took out of service. Um, on the east side we brought in the service, I think it's the first time since they were taken out of service to spread water on the east side of the valley. Jason Jason, uh, are you aware of some of the do we, the water we spread, are we able to pump some of that out here? I think we are, but I'm not really familiar with the ins and outs of the puppy plant, so I don't want to really comment on exactly how that works, but I, we, we do have a volume that we can pump, you know, from the groundwater. We have the infrastructure that pumps the well in place, and the last, you know, this year and in 2017, we put a lot more water into the water table. Like Jeff mentioned, from the river, the alluvial fans, all the creeks, so there's the water table that moves in. Recharge substantially for the past few years. And I guess maybe just one follow up question on that, and this may not be the right audience or question, but with respect to the new groundwater, California groundwater law um, for the basin, is, are there impediments or are there showstoppers in that that you guys know of that will impact, impact the ability to pump water back out? I'm not sure I'm not that's 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 the same. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, the, the long term water agreement, which is what manages pumping up in Owen Valley, is considered adjudicated. So we already have management in place okay. for, for Owen Valley for groundwater management. Okay. Don't worry. 
So my question is somewhat of oh. oh. okay, just, just a quick add on. Yes. Excuse me. Uh, the, there is there is still the question of possible use of groundwater under the Owens Lake offset And there is a disagreement between any other county and city about whether the water agreement applies to Owens Lake. Uh, the parties put that aside to go and try to study the groundwater, but that's still an outstanding uh, something in the future that will have to be uh, looked at. Cider. Sorry. Don't worry. Yeah, so my question is building on the other questions here. Um, because for a lot of management, the key is not for average projection of climate change is the extreme year. So I feel like you've done a really nice job in terms of the really wet years and how you guys might handle it. And one question with that is, is there concern about the groundwater um, rising and killing the veg managed vegetation? Because you talked right about about that level being really I think we Gary correct me if I'm wrong but I, we have to rely on our uh, drainage system and our drainage management unit you, you're going to say DMU a lot today <coughs> to kind of keep the water move levels down within those kind of vegetation areas. <coughs> that potential does exist definitely and that's something we protected the some of the managed veg areas that we might see tomorrow in T36, we've got some uh, diversion ditches for some of the runoff that just come down. Uh, to protect that exactly the whole Great. And then now flipping to the other side of the extreme on the drought years, um, what type of planning might you have in place for for when there are even more severe droughts? I think the districts uh, and CWP have already uh, done a lot of work to that end. Um, I think TWB uh, tillage, TWB square, and some of the other water efficient dust controls that were out there, um, and the state allowing us to do additional gravel, and then giving us more flexibility, are results of of them understanding, you know, the shortages. Uh, in 2015, I, uh, I believe a lot of, and, and, and Dr. Durad made this point in his presentation that the regulatory requirements, uh, the water demands for the valley came first, and the delivery to LA came second. The aqueduct was blocked off. There was no delivery to LA. Um, so the district uh, allowing us the flexibility to come in tillage, you know. That might have to happen on a more grander scale if there is a shortage to the point where there is just not enough water to put on the lake or anywhere else. You know, dust control can happen with the waterless method, and that's just the fact. But uh, will habitat be impacted that year? Yeah, but will we go back if things improve? Yeah, so there has to be flexibility built in. And what's that, you know, with the potential groundwater pumping for under the lake, would that cause even sort of more rapid loss of water so that you can't shallow flood? Um, that is um, still being analyzed. Uh, there's a groundwater working group that's developing uh, resource protection protocols for all of the concerned types of resources that might be impacted, everything from water quality, ground, the settlement of the ground uh, to impact to, you know, uh, groundwater dependent vegetated dunes. Um, and there's a lot of triggers and thresholds being developed to ensure that we, that DWP does not pump more than, um, than it should. So there's no set minimum on, on those conversations. Craig, then, Kyle? So, up to now, there's a discussion all the way about supply. Um, but if the temperature's going to go up to 4 degrees, um, you've got the transpiration off the lake go up a lot. And there's hydrologists at the table who'd be telling me a lot more about how much that's going to be. But I'm wondering what consideration has been made for that going into the future. 
teacher because you know so you can have less water you're also going to have higher power transpiration which introduces it and actually be higher to maintain the same amount of habitat for instance so the question about is the degree to which that's been considered plant I would say no we have not projected future uses based on increased temperatures like that. We have we haven't put plans in place for that. No. Definitely a concern though. So, my my question is pretty simple. I, I know that you already have a few reservoirs up the Owen trip. Uh, let's see how can you be building more reservoirs and dedicating some of those for control on the lake. Anybody got an answer to that? Okay, so when you spread that water and it goes through the soil, it's going to leak salts from the soil, and the water quality is going to be great. If you can store that on the surface, it might be a little bit better from the standpoint of water quality. What would be the impediment? You said it would be very difficult to do. Is it a matter of giving the land from private owners to the flood? Just building additional reservoirs, especially in the state of California, and getting permits. And yeah. I think it would be really hard to do that. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think it would be an uphill battle to try to do that. Bureaucracy wins again. For the law. I think there's a lot of focus on the question from the uh, from the panel rather than the external debate. Um, any other questions from the panel? Uh, anything from Venky on the phone? Okay, I'm not hearing anything. Do we have any public uh, requests for public comment? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Earl Wilson. No, I'm just getting the delivery. Oh, he's going to be fine. Okay. I'm a, local, I'm a local resident. I was born here in the valley, and I've devoted nearly 30 years of my life to Owen Slate County. Project that Pete and the rest of us have all been involved with it was about 10 years to Owen. Uh, I did come to this. I am involved with that group, and I just wanted to see how this was going. I'm impressed. Please do what your heart tells you to do, what your brain tells you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we don't have any other requests for public comment. Uh, and so with that, uh, we've reached the end of the agenda for the open session for today. So uh, I'll formally adjourn the meeting uh, and uh, then we'll make logistical plans for the committee for tonight. But I note that tomorrow morning we will also have a tour in case of the north uh, portion of the lake. Uh, and you can extend for it from here. Leaving 7:30 from here, so the same schedule as today, uh, and uh, we'll look at a number of additional sites. So, thanks to all the speakers uh, throughout the afternoon session, and we stand adjourned.